Good morning and welcome to To The Point. Here in Lansing, legislators have a lot to consider. A roads bill could be coming forward, but for sure there will be a new energy package coming out and that will impact everybody in the state, maybe for a decade or more to come. The chairman of the committee in the Senate who oversees all of that is Senator Mike Knopfs. He talks to us about the importance of this legislation. Senator, let's talk about a piece of legislation. I think this is my fourth or fifth show that I've done on it, but in fairness, there's not a lot of conversation that I hear going on outside of this chamber, but the energy legislation that you're working on, that your committee is in charge of, you're the head of the committee, mm -hmm. is potentially, from my standpoint, more impactful in the long term to the people of Michigan than the roads are, even though we hear so much more about the roads. Right. Would you agree with that assessment that this has a real impact on the state? I would agree with it, Rick, and the reason why is because we need energy each and every day and all of us need it, right? And so uh, it has been uh, a very important issue. Uh, that's why in the process, which is very important to me, I knew uh, I wanted to get a lot of different viewpoints. And so I put together uh, last year a 36-member work group, and we worked through the summer, even when we were supposed to be in recess, so I was working, but uh, I had all the different um, viewpoints at the table with 36 different uh, individuals representing diverse viewpoints. And so uh, we went through all the issues and wanted to get their perspective, and it was kind of interesting because at the end, we did start to come to a consensus on what we should really do for Michigan's future energy policy, but not just the next two or three years, but for the next 10 or 15 years. And uh, things are changing. Obviously, we're getting uh, a lot of um, demands from the federal government. They're sticking their nose into our business, and so we're trying to keep our autonomy and we're trying to do things what's good for Michigan uh, with the threat of the federal government's going to come in it that you don't do this and, and uh, some of the what they call 111D rules, the EPA and the mercury rule, and there are a lot of other discharge rules and, you know, of cooling water, and it's, it's very complicated. But uh, in understanding that, we still have to uh, plan for ourselves. I'm a big believer that you control your own destiny and you make decisions yourself uh, for the state of Michigan instead of letting the federal government do it. We'll be in a better position for representing our residents and keeping our rates uh, as low as we can. I want to give people some perspective on this because in an era of term limits, very often members are asked to tackle problems that they don't have a lot of historical perspective. You are the longest serving member in the legislature Not right the now. oldest, no, just I, the longest. <laughs> <laughs> but by virtue of the fact that you won a special election and served part of another Senate's uh, uh, term, uh, you are the longest serving legislature, that, uh, legislator, and that also gives you another interesting perspective, and that is that 10 years ago when our current energy policy was put together, you were there at the table, you worked with Governor Granholm, we had long conversations then. It was our number one priority. About the renewable right. uh, energy portfolio. Right. Portfolio standards, yeah. And then you said it is important to get this policy put together even if everything in it wasn't what you wanted because we have to have some policy so people can count on this going forward. It's been a decade, it's time to renew that policy. Tell me how the process has changed from then to now. Well, you know, a lot of it was obviously you got a different governor, so you have different interests, and uh, we went along with, and we got the votes to be able to pass in a bipartisan manner. I mean, half of the House and half of the Senate on both sides voted for this plan back in 2008. And so uh, what she wanted was, you know, renewable clean energy, uh, which was, uh, at that time was uh, solar and wind. And so uh, we decided to dive into that. We put some caps on it and some off ramps in case it got too expensive because we don't know what the future is going to do. But if you look back, it was the right decision to make, and we did make that good decision. And now, you know, renewable energy is clean and affordable. It can compete. We had to jumpstart it back then, and we did. And what this uh, package of bills that I'm working on right now is we'll take the mandates off because you know what? They can compete with baseload generation. Yeah, everybody has weaknesses, and, and different fuels have weaknesses and strengths. But in, in that thing, you know, the fuel's free as long as the sun is shining and the wind is blowing. And so uh, we have jump-started it, and I know people have seen the wind farms around the state of Michigan, and some like it and some don't, but you know, it does help in our portfolio of always be able to provide and have the option to provide that energy, which is cheap, <coughs> affordable, reliable, and clean. And uh, that's what we're trying to continue with this policy to be able to do that, as well as the energy optimization is what Governor Granholm called it. Governor Schneider calls it energy waste and reducing energy waste because <clears throat> the less energy you use, obviously your bill's gonna go down and we should encourage that and look at what we can do. And there is still a lot of things to do uh, and it does compete. And so I'm really excited about this package of bills because it complements what we did. And when we look back, 
we did get it right pretty, you know, not perfect, but it was, it was we're in a lot better position than a lot of other states. I bring that up because that was a time in this building where there were not a whole lot of easy to find bipartisan compromises with the budget <laughs> reign supreme. Oh, man. There were the faux government shutdowns. Right. There were all of the things that happened. But on that issue, Governor Granholm, Democrats and Republicans were able to put that together. It's a different scenario now. You have Republicans in control of the Senate and the House and over in the governor's office, but there is not a unified view of exactly what this policy would be, which is, goes back to what you were talking about, bringing all of the people, the stakeholders to the table. We're all stakeholders. So let me ask you what the biggest challenges are. We know that in this state there are at least nine coal-fired plants that are going to be closed in the relative near future. That's a lot of Next production couple years, capacity. Two or three years. Yep. So what do we do? What does this policy do? What do the companies do to replace all of, of that, that generating capability? Well, first of all, in this legislation, what I try to do and what the work group came up with, we shouldn't pick winners and losers. So we shouldn't choose what kind of fuel. We shouldn't say whether it should all be solar or all be wind or all be uh, coal or all be natural gas. So what I wrote in, in, in my bill that we're talking about is all of the above. And then let's start a process where all of the above competes and can prove that the capacity is there and the need is there and it is clean, it is available, it is reliable. And then let's put together our energy package for the state of Michigan. So we uh, put into uh, this, this uh, a bill an integrated resource plan, an IRP plan process, where we plan for the next 5, 10, and 15 years. And when the utilities have to plan, because they do have 90% of the market under the current statutes in the state of Michigan, they have to plan and then they have to go make that plan uh, proposal to the Michigan Public Service Commission. But what we put in this legislation is when they devise their plan, we then are going to require them to put out an, a request for proposal of what they want, what their needs are to replace those coal plants that you're talking about. And so it opens it up to everybody to come in and say, if you got wind that's cheap, you can make your proposal in front of the commission at, you know, with the uh, utility. And we'll see, and it'll all be transparent, the cost will be out there and what the other options are. So we're not going to pick. What we're going to do is put a process in place that does compete and all different fuel sources, all different technology to be able to provide the energy we need for the future and may the most reliable, the affordable and clean win. And we do put the standards in there for the Public Service Commission to, to uh, with those goals in the policy to make sure that they're looking at those when they make those decisions. Ultimately, the Public Service Commission, which represents all of us, it's an independent commission appointed by the governor every six years, so not, the governor doesn't get to appoint all three of them. There's only three members of the commission uh, that actually vote on the policy. They'll look at the presentation that the utilities make, and then after the utilities are done to make that presentation, they'll have all the other vendors, uh, whether they be private business or whatever, say, I can do that plant, or I can build a new plant cheaper than that, and here's what our cost would be. And then you let the Public Service Commission look, and they can give their blessing to the utility plan, and once they give their blessing, then it will end up in our rates and it allows them to go ahead and start building those, whatever that is, whether it be a new wind farm, whether it be a solar farm, whether it be uh, a natural gas or a combined cycle generation base load plant. Uh, we'll let them go ahead and say, you got the right mix or you don't have the right mix. And if you don't have the right mix, you got to go back and because we've heard these other proposals that were public all out in the open. We think they have some better ideas over there, so you need to refine your plan and come back and make another proposal. And that's the process we want, because then it is open and everybody can compete. And everybody, then we, I think in the end, we get the best fuel at the time, the best technology that's available today to be able, be able to provide that energy. And long term, it lets us know where we're gonna go and, and uh, to make sure, because reliability is so important to our manufacturers and, and to our businesses. Uh, if they have to shut down a big factory, it costs hundreds of millions of dollars, and that's not a good thing. Well, and you talk about reliability, and as you were talking about it, I was thinking, because, and we'll get to this in a moment, there are responsibilities on the part of the utility company to be able to provide a certain level. They have to prove that they have this much available power right. out there, and we're going to get to choice in a minute. But, right. So they've got to have this much. So if I come to you with a proposal and say, well, I've got a great way to produce uh, wind energy, for example, and it's very inexpensive, 
But the problem is, as you said earlier, the wind doesn't always blow. Whereas right. a coal-fired plant, I can fire up 365 days out of the year. So how does that work? Because you have to be sure that they have that level, and I don't know what the level is, to be honest, but right. they have to have a, a particular amount of energy if they're going All to be in, in, this, in this arena. Yeah. So that, 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 that puts wind and, and, and uh, solar somewhat at a disadvantage. Right, right now it does, but there's technology out there that is, uh, you know, coming to fruition, uh, which battery technology. So when the wind is blowing, you go ahead and produce the energy, and then you can store it in batteries, and then you can turn it on. And so one of the weaknesses of wind is the wind isn't blowing all the time, and the weaknesses of solar is that you know the sun isn't shining all the time, especially in Michigan, especially during the winter, and so. Uh, if you find those technologies that they come available, that's why this is a um, process for every five years. We look at it and see what technology is out there. And so if battery storage comes up and it is uh, basically competitive and it does help. And the cost of batteries have come down for this about 50% in the last 10 years. And so we're getting down to where that might be an option. So they can compete even more. But you're right, you do right now today with those other sources, you have to have some backup power because when we go turn the light switch on, we want it to come on. And so uh, we have to have that base load generation. That's why it's important. But what we want to do is have the experts, which are the utilities are obviously in that field and working that every day. You have other experts out there that uh, say, no, I got this technology or I can do this with wind and solar and or uh, biomass or, or whatever, uh, methane, whatever, you know, the capture of it and, and the uh, heating of it or burning of it. And then um, you have the Public Service Commission that will weigh all that, and we have a lot of experts over there and staff in the Public Service Commission, and they'll make the determination under the guidelines that we give them in the legislation, and we are in this legislation given the Michigan Public Service Commission more authority. And the other thing we are taking away that I just want to slip in here is the fact that uh, we have a self-implementation rates right now that the utilities can go ahead and set their own rates. It takes a year for the commission to say, okay, that was a good rate or it wasn't a good rate, and you have to refund the money back, and that's why people see refunds sometimes on their bills. We're taking that ability away from the uh, uh, utilities right now. That's the state law today that they have, and we're instituting that the Public Service Commission has to, when a case is filed for a rate increase or for an integrated resource plan, they have 10 months to basically decide. It goes from 12 to 10 months, but we're putting that authority back with the Public Service Commission and giving them more authority so they have more standing to be able to make these wise decisions after we get this policy done. So if big energy companies have the ability to service most of the state, what do we expect from them? We'll talk with Senator Knopfs about that next to the point. Welcome back to To The Point. This morning, we're talking with Senator Mike Knopfs about the state's new energy policy. What will it look like and what will it mean to you? Let's talk about what we expect from these utilities. I, I think of utilities somewhat like people might think about the state police, which is your background. Yeah. When you call them, you want them there. Oh, yeah. But you don't necessarily want to pass them with a radar gun under a bypass out here as you're going around town. And the right. same thing is true with utilities. Everybody wants that utility to be there all the time and to be absolutely reliable. But they don't always like the fact that they're the only game in town and that they're a monopoly in the right. area. So we got a couple right. of big players in the state. Right. And they have this market sewn up, but they also have some responsibility. How, do you, how, do, how does that play off? Well, you, I think you're talking about the choice program or the retail open access part of the, the policy that we have today. Back in 2008, we did that. Um, what I've decided in this package of bills is I'm going to honor that commitment that we made, even though others around town here would like to have 100% of the market go into the utilities. Uh, and so uh, in working back, as you said, with my longevity back in 2008, I remember those promises we made. And so I want to honor those promises. So if today I'd like to tell people if you're out on this choice program, but you're on the wholesale market and you're out getting your own energy from somebody else other than the utilities, you can stay out there forever. I am not going to force you. It's voluntary. If, like you say, you want, they want to come back, they can come back. Uh, you know, if the market changes out there and all of a sudden the utility is cheaper than the open market, they'll want to come back because they want the cheapest price. The problem is, is that going back and forth, which is the law today, we keep the system going so they can come ba go back and forth all the time because we, I would say we, residents, we are footing the bill for that, as well as some uh, uh, small commercial and some, some industrial. And yet, we don't get to take advantage of it, or we don't get marketed to. And so uh, what I'm saying is, we'll leave that option available, but you're going to have to pay for that ability to come back. And what is that worth to you to be able to come back and have that safeguard? 
where today you don't pay for it. And you are being subsidized by all of us because we've got to keep the system going. The other thing in this policy we're doing is telling utilities because they're going to have to replace so many plants. We don't want them building extra plants that they don't need, especially when you're out with an alternative energy supplier. You're okay, stay out there and keep your contract, do what you want to do. If they have to build more to take care of you but not use it, we get to pay for it. And we don't want that to happen because it's very expensive and our bills will go up. And so what we're looking at is the cost of our rates right now as compared to other states around us. And right now in the residential and commercial, we're higher. In the industrial, just in 2015, the stuff we did in 2008, there were a lot of successes. The industrial rate has come down 8% this year for the big industrial users. And the things that we've done, uh, there's a public act, uh, 169, that uh, Senator Thomas uh, authored that we got passed last year that helped high intensity user group, had a reevaluation of what is the cost of service to get their door. We're trying to get rid of all the subsidies, everybody pay for whatever the cost is to get it there and then keep our rates lower and compete. And so uh, there are a lot of different things going on. And what I did do is I made the promise in the 2008 law that they could be out there. I'm going to keep that promise that they can stay out there. And there's a queue. There's about, I think you've heard, there's 11,000 companies that like to go out in the open market right now because it is cheaper right now. And so it's because natural gas prices have come down. But back in 2007, 2008, natural gas was real high. And we had 100% open market and only 3% were taking care of it back in 2008 and using it. And so, you know, there is an expense to be able to jump back and forth. And what we're trying to do is limit those expenses so people that don't get a benefit from it don't have to pay the subsidies to allow others that are getting a benefit from it to be able to utilize. And to, to put a little finer point on it, I mean, part of the problem that you have to wrestle with is that going to the open market is a fine thing when, as you say, when you can save money. But if those natural gas prices spike again, you still have to have those base generation companies, the, the big utilities as we know them here, right. that are able to pick up the slack. And so in the interim, you're saying you don't want to have to pay for capacity that's not being used because right. then people who aren't on the market. So right. what happens then if all those people jump back in? Is there going to be enough capacity? Well, there may not be because as you close these plants and then we're requiring, we're basically saying utilities are not going to be the provider of last resort anymore. And you, people that are, you businesses and others that are out there on the open market, your alternative energy suppliers, we're going to require them to show that they have the capacity for two or three years down the road, even past their contracts. And so that's one of the points that still has to get, we have to settle that issue yet, and we're not there yet in this legislation, and we're working on that. But what we are saying is that, you know, because of all these rules and because it's going to be expensive, our bills are going to go up because the federal government is basically, we have an old fleet of coal plants, but they still have about 10, 10 12 years of uh, uh, useful life left but the federal government's putting a time frame on and when they have to be shut down because of the new standards coming out of the smokestacks, what they have to meet, right? And so uh, we're gonna have to close them. So all of our rates are gonna go up because we're, we're replacing uh, that old fleet. And the other thing that, that people don't understand with this policy is we're gonna lose a lot of good paying jobs going from coal to natural gas. It doesn't take as many employees to run a natural gas plant as it does to, a, to take care of a coal plant. So there are gonna be a lot of jobs that are gonna be lost uh, with the utilities uh, when they turn around and go from coal to natural gas and or wind or solar or whatever. The other thing that we're doing is the way utilities make money is they want to build new plants. That's how they make money. In this policy, we're going to allow them to make a rate of return on purchase power agreements that they may have with an outside vendor so they still can make a rate of return because if it is ex less expensive to go that direction, we don't want to put you out of business. We want you to still be there to be able to do that base load generation. But we want you to look at other options and know that you can get a rate of return, a respectable rate of return, but yet still have a contract with some other third supplier to take care of our energy needs that, you know, whether it be a wind farm or a solar farm or whatever. So it encourages that diverse. It's just like your portfolio for your stocks. You want to have a diverse portfolio. Well, we want to have that with energy too because we don't know what the future is going to hold and we want to be able to adapt and you don't want to have to come back to the legislature to be able to have to change the statute because we pick and choose. My policy is going to allow all that through this process I talked about to be able to the Public Service Commission say today, whether it be five years, 10 years or 15 years down, this is the best choice we have. This is the way we should go. And they should be able to do that without coming back to the legislature. How nimble are these companies? Because it seems to me that building a power plant is a big undertaking. It takes a lot of work. And once you get it built, you have to run it for a number of years for it to be profitable. You've got a long-term mortgage. You're so right. if you invest uh, in natural gas type of generation systems and natural gas spikes, as we know it can, 
I mean, we, we watch, it, it's different, I understand, than crude, but the, but, the process is the same, but, demand, but, uh, supply, all of the costs that go with it. If we get three new natural gas uh, production systems and that gas doubles, right. then what do we do? Well, then you're hurting. <laughs> you know, and that's why, again, having that diverse portfolio, then you'll have to look at and hopefully there'll be the, you know, the battery storage will be coming on fruition, coming online, and we'll have other options available to us that we would be able to take care of that uh, problem without, again, running back to the legislature. You're right. I mean, natural gas right now is cheap, right? Well, we as a nation now want to start exporting that, and they're starting to develop ports down in Louisiana to export all of that to Britain and all those that are relying on Russia that don't like, like relying on Russia. We'd like to be able to, you know, get that supply to them. But then, as all these new um, parameters are coming from the federal government, every state's going to be going to natural gas base load generation, basically. And so when you do that, that demand's going to go up. And then if they start exporting, that demand's going to go up worldwide now. And we know when it goes worldwide, the price does shoot up and we don't control the price as much. And so the market could change. And so that's what we also have to plan for. So when those individuals that they want to run back to be able to come back to the utility, what we say in this legislation is, it's okay, you work it out with the utility. When you can come back, you can come back. But when you can come back, if they don't have capacity, they can take you right away. But if they, if they do have capacity, they can take you right away. If they don't have capacity, then whatever you have to build to take care of your load to be able to come back, because these are you know, uh, companies that have a lot of load requests for energy, if you have to build something, that's up between you two. You can't put it on us, the residents, to pay for you coming back. And that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to take away all the subsidies, all the mandates, the renewable portfolio standing charge that's on your bill is gonna come off. The energy efficiency uh, uh, line item, which is about 350 on my bill every month, is going to come off. And so you'll start to see a little bit of reduction in your residential rates as these mandates come off and these subsidies come off and we start making everybody pay for what their true cost is. When we talked about this during the last incarnation, I said something to the effect of if you put these things in place, my utility bill is going to go up. And you said, maybe, but your utility bill is going up if we don't do anything. Yeah. Is this the next best step? Because you just said we're likely to see an increase in rates at some point because you're going to have to build all these new plants. Right. Is this, from your perspective, the next best step to keep those prices from rising too far, too fast? I think it gives us the options to try to be able to control to what extent we can control that to be able to do. And that's the reason why I want the, I don't know what fuel source is going to be there for our energy production. I want to open it up and we want to look at everything that's available that day as these prices start to spike and make the best decisions on what is good for Michigan in its future. Understanding that we're going to have some rules, probably we're going to have to follow with the federal government and the mandates they're putting on us, which basically is truly is going to cost us more money. And so um, people shouldn't expect, we're trying to keep our rates, uh, the main goal of this policy is to uh, get our rates in line with the national averages. We've done that with, like I said, with the industrial class, we have their, their rates have come down 8% this year. Uh, we've also um, looking at now the uh, commercial class and, and the residential class to try to be able to bring theirs down. And so um, I think we're being successful. If you look at bar graph that I saw in committee testimony, uh, it showed that the um, alternative energy suppliers costs are going up, the open market, and our, our utility prices are coming down. And so I think we're headed in the right direction. And so um, I think if we expand and leave the options on the table and leave it to the Public Service Commission, give them the authority to be able to look at the marketplace, let someone and everybody come in and make proposals, let them to try to put together a portfolio and say, okay, this is what we approve, this is what we'll put on our rates because it's the most cost effective, it's clean, and it's affordable. And I think there is, and I give this governor a lot of credit with his uh, energy waste reduction, I think there's a lot more that we could do there. And it is a good investment because if you don't need the energy, obviously your bill is going to go down. And there is a long-term thing if you put insulation in or windows or whatever you want to do, lights and, you know, those types of things. Um, I think that helps everybody. And we make those options available every class, whether it be industrial, commercial, or the residential class that uses the energy. I think we all benefit from that because then we don't have to build another power plant and therefore our rates won't go up. Our thanks to Senator Knopfs. We're back with a final thought next to the point. In addition to keeping up with that energy legislation and trying to figure out what happens next with roads, over the next few weeks, we're going to be focusing on a special election in the 80th House District. That's where Cindy Gamrat was expelled. She and seven other Republicans, plus one Democrat, are running, and we'll feature them here in the coming weeks to the point.